I hope that everyone had a really great lunch break. Um, the weather was very kind to us today. I know that a lot of people went for a walk and I enjoyed sitting outside on the concrete where it was beautifully warm. Um, I'm Catherine Tattersall. I live in Hobart, so this is, this is my home. Um, I work at CSIRO, which is the Federal Government Research Institute and with OBUS Australia, the OBUS Australia node, and I'm the co-chair of the OBUS steering group. Um, I'm very happy today to announce that um, we've got Tim Sherritt joining us for our Tuesday plenary. Tim is a historian and he, historian and a hacker and has a long history of working with Trove, which is an Australian um, humanities database, a very, very broad reaching, very rich um, data source. And he's going to give us a slightly different view of um, how you can work with standardised data. Um, he's been working in the cultural heritage sector for a long time. He's an associate professor at the University of Canberra. And I know that a lot of us are going to be in Canberra next week. So um, we'll get to see the weather that Tim used to enjoy before he moved to Tasmania not, not that long ago, I think just pre-COVID, you were saying. Um, so you can ask. Tim, whether he prefers Tasmania or Canberra, if you want to. Um, he's been working on the GLAM workbench, which is a, um, a tool, I think, mostly a, a Python or a Jupyter notebook-based tool to bridge the gap between uh, coders and GLAM material curators. I'm looking to him to see whether I've interpreted it properly. Um, and is now working on an Australian government-funded community data lab to share tools and data sets for collaborative house research projects. Um, I'm very excited to see um, what we learn today um, and also looking forward to listening to someone who's working slightly outside the domain that I work in myself. So, uh, Tim, take it away. Um, thanks, Catherine, and thanks, Ali, and the organisers for the invitation to be here today. Um, and to those tuning in from elsewhere, um, <laughs> uh, greetings from beautiful Nipaluna, um, and um, where we are, of course, on the unceded lands of the Mwinana people. And uh, I think this week it uh, seems more important than ever to uh, recognise that we are meeting on stolen lands. Um, my slides today are actually online, so if you'd like to play along, you can, and obviously if you're tuning in remotely, you can um, have a look um, and uh, explore, follow the links, and they'll stay online, so feel free to share them. Uh, they're all openly licensed, so um, um, you can do whatever you like with them, basically. Um, so today I'm going to be exploring some of the possibilities of GLAM data uh, from the perspective of the humanities. Um, and I suppose I should start by unpacking the acronym, the GLAM acronym, um, because I know while it's uh, pretty commonly used here in Australia, it's not universal. Um, so GLAM is uh, galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. Um, and I really need to insert a bit of a, a disclaimer in here. Um, Something you know, I'm really uh, conscious that uh, being an event like this, that when I when I talk about glam data, um, I'm really talking about things like uh, you know government archives, books, letters, newspapers, photographs, um, uh, artifacts, artworks, you know, the sort of stuff that gets labelled cultural heritage. And of course, a, a conference like this um, makes it very clear that there's a whole world of GLAM data beyond my limited perspective. Um, so I hope you'll forgive my sort of shorthand today when I'm talking about GLAM data. Um, I'm also hoping that um, by talking about uh, some of my own interests and activities in GLAM data, that we can identify possibilities and problems that affect us all. Um, because really the sorts of questions that motivate me in, in my work are things like the impact of online access to GLAM collections, um, how we see collections, uh, what sort of questions can we ask of them, and what sort of skills do researchers need to work with GLAM data. 
Um, oh, I should say too that I've also shared that link in the Slack channel for this keynote. So if you haven't noted it down, you can go and find it there as well. Okay, so um, uh, despite that disclaimer, it's not that I'm not interested in science because I actually started uh, my own research as a historian of Australian science. Um, and um, one of my first jobs was working for an organization called the Australian Science Archives Project based out of the University of Melbourne, which worked to make sure that the papers of scientists were preserved and deposited somewhere. Um, and I was working for ASAP, it's a great acronym, uh, in 1994, when I first became aware of this thing called the World Wide Web. Uh, and as a small organization uh, with very limited resources, we realized that we could use the web to communicate with researchers, to help them find and use archival collections and materials relating to the history of Australian science. Uh, and we created um, what, uh, well, it was the first, well, the fonts are going to be weird, was the first website about archives in Australia uh, and one of the first websites relating to Australian history generally. In the years that followed, um, I developed a lot of websites, uh, taught myself the, you know, the basics of PHP and JavaScript and all that sort of stuff. But it wasn't really until 2007 that I realized how computational methods could be used to manipulate cultural heritage collections and data to see, to create new access points into collections, new ways of seeing. Um, I was then working for the National Archives of Australia, um, where an exhibition was being planned on World War I. The archives had recently digitized over 375,000 World War I service records. Um, and we were thinking about how these might be used in a, a digital resource to accompany a physical exhibition. In those days, you know, the digital had to be tapped onto for any interest. Um, these records, the World War I service records, are held in series B2455, and that's how they look in the National Archives Online Database record search, which has actually changed very little since 2007. <laughs> um, but if we focus on the file titles, um, we see that they contain specific pieces of information, right? names, service numbers, places of birth, places of enlistment, all separated by colons. So it's really structured data right? of the kind that you might find in a, in a you know, CSV file, a spreadsheet file. And this was a deliberate and really far-sighted choice by the NAA staff um, creating descriptions that would be open to future uses, whatever they might be. So I suggested that we grab all of the file titles, extract all of the data, geolocate the place names, uh, and make a map interface to the records um, so that users could find service records, not by searching for a name, but by simply clicking on the map. Um, <laughs> and I don't have to tell this audience that it wasn't quite that simple. <laughs> um, you know, the data wasn't always consistent. The place names couldn't be matched to current locations. And I think I counted 12 or 13 different spellings of the word lieutenant. Um, but, you know, as you know, I mean, that's the nature of a lot of the data that we work with. A lot of it represents human activity within the output of machines. So there'll always be these sorts of challenges. You know, lots of time spent cleaning data is certainly something I think we'd all have in common. Ooh. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what happened there. Um, um, so this was a screenshot which had the, uh, the uh, little map interface in the middle there with lots of markers uh, showing up. Um, uh, you know, use a PDF because, you know, PDFs don't. <laughs> um, anyway, um, you can obviously check it out online to see what the image is, but it's a, a map interface with lots of little market, uh, clustered markers in the middle of it. Um, and the site itself was quite innovative for the time, both in its use of maps to explore archival collections uh, and in some of the user engagement features uh, that we added. Um, and I even got to demonstrate it to the Prime Minister. 
Um, for overseas viewers, <laughs> Kevin was uh, former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd. Um, but to get the map interface running in web browsers of the time, we had to make some or many compromises, really. Um, we could only show a limited number of markers or else, you know, Internet Explorer would explode. Um, so we had to split the results by state and we had to cluster the markers into groups. Why was that a problem? At some point, I decided to look at the complete data set by loading it into Google Earth. And this is what I saw. Markers just everywhere. Um, for those who don't know much about Australia, those markers just represent the population density effectively in Australia. They were everywhere. Um, and as I zoomed in, the names resolved. And they were just everywhere. So these are places where World War I soldiers were born effectively. All of those little towns, as you zoomed in and the names appeared, all of those little towns sent their young people to fight and die. It was a different way of seeing the impact of World War I on Australia. So I left the National Archives um, not long after, um, but I continued to work with their data. And I taught myself uh, you know, enough Python to be dangerous um, and uh, built a screen scraper to extract structured data out of record search, which meant I could download metadata and images from thousands of files. Um, and that scraper still works. Um, in fact, I gave it a major overhaul um, a couple of years ago, so it's online and you can find it and use it. Um, my partner and I, Kate Bagnall, were um, particularly interested in records relating to the administration of the white Australia policy. Um, Kate is actually a historian of Chinese Australia um, and has worked with these records extensively. Now, to provide a bit of context here, um, when the Australian colonies came together in 1901 to form a nation, one of the principles that brought them together was that the nation would be white. Um, to achieve this, uh, they very early on, they introduced a racially based immigration system, uh, which became known as the White Australia Policy. And to our shame, that operated until the 1960s. Now, the National Archives Australia uh, records include special certificates like this that um, non-white residents, um, and you know, part of the, the myth of white Australia was, uh, you know, there were at the time when that legislation was introduced, many thousands of people who were uh, non-white as well as indigenous Australians living in Australia. So the idea that Australia was white was always sort of a bizarre racial myth. Um, but um, so if people, non-white people living in Australia wanted to travel overseas and come back, they need to had to carry special documentation with them. And this is an example of what they needed. Without this documentation, they would be subjected to a thing called the dictation test um, on their return and refused entry. So basically weren't allowed to come home. Um, uh, the dictation test, was um, you know, a fairly benign sounding label, but it was actually the mechanism of exclusion. Nobody was expected to pass the dictation test. Now, there are many thousands of these records held in the National Archives of Australia. Um, as I said, uh, Kate and I were interested in, in encouraging uh, awareness and use of these records. So in 2011, um, I fired up my, my scraper and downloaded all of the available images from one series of these documents, ended up with about 12,000 pages, um, and I then used a facial detection script to locate the portrait photographs um, in those certificates um, and crop them from the page images. Um, and after weeding out the false positives, we had a collection of more than 7,000 faces. And we displayed them using, um, you know, the simplest means possible, just on one big scrolling wall. This was the real face of White Australia. Um, and um, I upgraded the underlying technology since then, but left the design much the same. You know, even after all these years, just scrolling through a seemingly endless wall of faces is powerful and disturbing. 
Glam data can help us to see differently and to feel differently. The first beta version of the National Library of, National Library of Australia's digitised newspaper project was released in 2008. Um, and it merged into their new discovery service. Uh, uh, and it merged a year later, it merged into their new discovery service, Trove. Now, Trove, for those who haven't heard of it, it's a number of different services, really. Um, it aggregates content from hundreds of other GLAM organizations and research agencies uh, in much the same way as Europeana works or the Digital Public Library of America, Digital NZ. Um, there's similar sort of aggregators in Brazil and Japan too, I think. Um, but it's also a platform for the delivery of content which has been digitised by the National Library and its partners. So that includes newspapers, books, maps, photographs, uh, manuscripts, um, and also as a repository for born digital content, um, such as web archives. Trove's digitised newspapers have, um, you know, fundamentally changed research in a number of humanities disciplines, particularly history. Trove delivers metadata, uh, page images, and the OCR text extracted from those images. Um, Im importantly, though, this data is segmented into individual articles, um, not pages or issues, which is how some other digitised newspapers work. Um, so when you couple that sort of article level OCR with a good search engine, you have a way of looking beyond established historical narratives of observing the individual fragments of lived experience, the small stories. But what about the big picture? Um, I started poking around inside Trove about uh, 2010 um, and once again, I created a screen scraper to, uh, um, uh, to extract structured data from the, the web interface. Um, and using this data, I started to create visualizations um, of, of the search queries within Trove. Um, and uh, that's an example which shows the number of matching articles per year for a particular search in Trove's newspapers. Um, in that case, it's comparing Australian or British, the terms Australian or British, and their occurrence within the digitised newspapers. Um, that was a very early version of a tool called QueryPick, and it's been through many iterations, um, and I continue to maintain and develop it. Um, there are many uh, caveats and um, qualifications to apply to these sorts of visualizations. And I tend to say that, you know, they're not arguments, but they can help you frame your questions. They highlight possible patterns and trends, um, shifts in language, changes in technology, the impact of specific events, for example. Um, and as you can see um, from these examples, you can compare search terms to uh, observe different trajectories. So the one on the uh, right there uh, is comparing um, wireless in orange with radio in blue and no, wireless is red, uh, blue is uh, radio and uh, the orange is telegraph. Um, so just looking at language around communication technologies um, and how they changed uh, from just by doing searches within the digitized newspapers. So query pick enables you to zoom out of the search interface, but once you have access to the underlying data, uh, you can also zoom in, analyzing in detail the contents and contexts of, of individual newspaper articles. Um, and I also created a harvester which uh, helps researchers build custom data sets of metadata and text. Um, and again, it's been through many iterations, but it's still in service. And so you can use that to actually harvest out the detail of thousands of newspaper articles, um, even in fact, millions of newspaper articles. Um, so, um, uh, fairly early on, I tried an experiment to look at the changing nature of front pages in newspapers. Um, 
As you may know, uh, newspapers in the 19th and early 20th centuries tended to have advertising on the front page rather than news stories, you know, the headlines. Um, and so, and Trove uh, categorizes its articles. It, it indicates whether they're advertising or whether they're like a news type article. And it also provides the number of words in each article. So putting those together, I could make calculations about the number of words in advertising versus the number of words in news articles um, on front pages over time. Um, and so in order to do that, I harvested back in uh, 2012, I harvested 4 million newspaper articles, um, extracted the metadata and, and created some visualizations. And I actually repeated the process just recently um, uh, because, you know, Trove has continued to expand. I ended up having to harvest 19 million uh, articles from Trove. Um, and if you look at that over time, look at the sort of overall trend across all the newspapers, you can see that there's a sort of crossover from advertising to news articles uh, around the 1920s and 30s. Um, but you can also look at the sort of histories of individual newspapers. Uh, so that case there on the, the right is the Sydney Morning Herald, uh, one of Australia's you know, major, major newspapers. Um, and it was one of the last to actually change from having advertising on its front page. Um, so the chart on the, the top there shows the sort of complete history of the Sydney Morning Herald, the blue line being words in advertising and the orange line being words in news articles. And you can see it changes over in the 1940s. They cross in the 1940s. And so the second chart actually zooms in on that period, the crossover period. Um, and you can see it basically changed overnight. So the blue dots are numbers of words in advertising, the orange dots numbers of words in news. And uh, I think it was April 1942 or thereabouts, it just changed one day to the next. Um, all of a sudden it had headlines and photographs and things like that on the front page. Um, in 2012, Trove released a, a public API, Application Programming Interface. Um, and as I'm sure this audience knows, APIs delivered the structured data directly upon request, so no screen scraping necessary, and that meant I could update all of my tools. But it also opened up a new range of possible integrations and analyses. Um, instead of just a website, Trove became a platform, something to build upon. Um, I was actually manager of Trove uh, for a few years from 2013. Um, and the idea of Trove as a platform for new research, for building new things um, and for seeing differently was something that I always try to emphasize. It was what really got me excited. Still does. But what happens when you turn something like Query Pick, my tool for visualizing searches, back onto Trove itself? If we don't use a search query to limit our results, what we see are the total number of digitized articles in Trove per year. This is a representation of the complete newspaper corpus, which currently stands at over 200 million digitized newspaper articles. So this is what people are searching when they type stuff into the search box. And I've been creating these sorts of charts at irregular intervals over the years, and they show some interesting changes. So between 2011 on the left there and uh, 2014, um, you can see that the number of articles for the period around World War I uh, increased dramatically. So we have this sort of quite remarkable peak in 2014, on, in 1915. Why? Well, it was because in the lead up to the centenary of World War I, it was decided to focus digitization dollars on the World War I period. And the impact of that decision can still be seen today. So we're still seeing that peak in 1915. Other years are starting to catch up, but very slowly. You know, and of course, priorities have to be set. Decisions about funding have to be made. Um, the point is that these decisions shape online collections. They help construct what we mean by access. 
However, the effects of these priorities are rarely exposed through the standard interfaces that we use to search collections. We only see them when we get access to and start to explore the data underneath. And I wanted to point out that, yes, it does. I don't know why that 2021 is there. Anyway, um, so that um, is from last Sunday, that chart, because I've actually created now a, like a data dashboard, um, which saves uh, summary data from Trove newspapers every Sunday uh, and creates an updated version, a series of visualizations showing the sort of shape of the corpus every week. Um, and that's because it's something which I think is very important for researchers to understand that these resources that they rely so heavily on now are shaped by all sorts of forces such as funding um, and technology um, and that they need to actually be aware of how these things change if they're actually going to be using them in their research. Um, so yes, every Sunday you can, you can drop in to see how many uh, newspaper articles have been added in the past week. Uh, and see how it's changed over the last year or so since I started harvesting the data. Um, one thing which has interested me a lot over a number of years, uh, the, um, are the files in the National Archives that we're not allowed to see. Under the Archives Act in Australia, government files more than 20 years old are open to the public. However, before they're released, they go through a process known as access examination um, to make sure there's nothing in them that might sort of endanger our national security uh, or infringe on anybody's privacy. Most files are made fully open. Um, some have pages removed or redactions applied. Um, a much smaller number are withheld completely. And in Record Search, the database, uh, these files that are withheld are given the access status of closed. The files are not available, but metadata about them is. In 2016, I started harvesting details of all the closed files from Record Search. Um, and I created an interface uh, from that last page where you could actually see what you couldn't see. Um, as I've said previously, it's probably the most uh, frustrating search interface ever devised um, in that you can actually search all these files and then realize that there's no way you can actually see them. Um, I've re been repeating this harvest on the 1st of January every year ever since then to see what changes. Um, and for me, it's a way of examining access not as a set of rules which are laid down in the Archives Act, but as a changing historical practice. Um, as I mentioned, some files are open, but with words and phrases redacted. Um, and I wondered um, at one point whether it might be possible to quantify the scale of redaction. Um, so, of course, I downloaded many thousands of page Im images from publicly available ASIO surveillance files, um, ASIO being Australia's internal uh, security agency. Um, so particularly in the 50s, they were very keen on, on uh, surveilling all sorts of people within Australian society, and those files are in restricted form available. So um, I developed a redaction finder um, and got a collection of many thousands of little tiny redactions, or some really big redactions, but lots of little tiny ones. Um, and yes, you can uh, buy your own uh, redaction art scarf. Uh, from Redbubble, if you would like. Um, perfect for sort of, uh, you know, going about in public and not being seen, of course. Um, uh, so, yeah, I got a bit distracted from the whole uh, idea of quantification <laughs> um, by the just the aesthetic qualities of the redactions themselves. Um, and this was particularly so uh, when I discovered these guys uh, lurking amidst the ASIO files um, these are actual redactions from um, ASIO surveillance files. Um, somebody got a bit bored. <laughs> um, but yeah, but to me, you know, it's another example of how the construction of access to online collections is a very human process. You know, there's somebody behind the scenes doing this. But Online access is not just something delivered to a grateful audience. 
You know, it's something that has to be taken. It's not just determined by the interfaces we build or the data sets we published, but also by the skills and confidence of those who might make use of them. What's the point of an API if people who might benefit from it most, benefit from it most don't know how to use it or just don't see the point of it? Um, more and more GLAM data is becoming available, of course, in a variety of different forms from um, you know, a wide range of different sources. Uh, so lots of rich and interesting data to explore, but how do we help people make use of it? You know, there are lots uh, of training opportunities around now, things like software carpentry, for example. Um, but the work of finding potential users and exposing them to the possibilities of GLAM data is ongoing and evolving. And that's why I spend a lot of my time now uh, working on this thing called the it's really weird glitches, <laughs> really a uh, thing called the GLAM Workbench. So the GLAM Workbench includes the latest versions of tools that I've created over the last 10 years or so. Um, so things like Query Pick that I mentioned before, the harvesters for Trove newspapers and record search. Um, but it's growing all the time. Uh, it's not just a collection of tools, uh, but also um, but also tutorials, examples, hacks, and a range of pre-harvested data sets. Uh, it, also, it has resources uh, relating to a range of uh, different GLAM collections, um, and there's a few examples. Um, so as well as Trove, Digital NZ, um, National Archives Australia, National Museum of Australia, Te Papa, um, Web Archives, um, So, uh, yeah, so Web Archives, for example. So most of them, as you would see, is relate to Australia and New Zealand in particular, but there are some which go further afield. Um, Web Archives obviously uh, works across um, the Wayback Machine as well as the Australian Web Archive, as well as the UK Web Archive. Um, and in fact, uh, the Web Archive section of the Glam Workbench is sponsored by the British Library um, and they were involved in its creation. Um, National Archives of Australia, um, that one is Digital NZ, lost its hitting, uh, uh, Commonwealth Hansard, so which comes from the Parliamentary Library, so all of the words spoken in the Australian Commonwealth Parliament are available, um, and I've put them into a data set which you can access. Um, and there's also a large uh, number of uh, data sets which are being shared through open government data portals from GLAM organisations, hundreds of them. Um, so I, I provide some examples of those sorts of things as well. Um, generally, the, the resources are organised around these sorts of topics. So uh, assembling data, just harvesting things, bringing things together in data sets, which you can then explore and analyse. Asking questions, so creating visualisations, doing different types of analyses. Um, hacking heritage is really a sort of workarounds for, you know, where there are um, restrictions in the way you can access data or get data. Uh, and live documentation, just sort of supplementing what's available around these data sources by providing real live examples. The GLAM Workbench uh, makes use of Jupyter Notebooks. Um, and understanding what Jupyter makes possible was really a turning point for me it offers me easier ways of, of maintaining, sharing, and documenting the sorts of tools that I create. But it also helps users overcome some of those initial barriers that make digital research seem all too hard. Jupyter Notebooks can build confidence by simply allowing users to try things in their browser, to try running a piece of code, creating an API, or building a visualization. And this has helped me start to think of the GLAM Workbench not just as a collection of tools, but as a series of possible pathways. So, for example, um, well, you know, a GLAM organization creates a public API that lets users explore their collection data. You know, fantastic, that's awesome. But why would the researchers bother? What can they do with the API that they couldn't do before? 
what's in it for them? You know, if we want to spend, if we want researchers to spend some time uh, exploring GLAM data, then we have to illustrate the why as well as the how. Jupyter Notebooks combine text and code into what's been called a, a computational narrative. Um, and it runs in your web browser. So if, for example, you're documenting how an API works, you can not only talk about things like you know, endpoints and parameters, you can provide live code snippets that make real queries, return real data, and answer real questions. Um, the GLAM workbench, as an example, includes um, an introductory getting started notebook that demonstrates how notebooks themselves work. But it does this by retrieving and visualizing real data from the National Mu Museum of Australia's collection API. In the National Museum of Australia section uh, of the GLAM workbench, there are more notebooks that explore in detail the sorts of data that's available from the API and how you can use it to visualize the National Museum's collections over time and space. The API is introduced not as a series of technical specifications, but through the sorts of questions that it makes possible. Um, and the same applies to a number of other collection APIs that are explored in the GLAM workbench. Um, but of course, it's not just happening within the GLAM workbench. A number of other GLAM organizations around the world are recognizing the value of Jupyter Notebooks in supplementing conventional forms of documentation, making users aware of some of the possibilities embedded within their data. Jupyter Notebooks can be both tool and tutorial. Users can learn about a new GLAM data source not just by reading about it, but by undertaking real research tasks. If someone arrives at the GLAM workbench uh, and finds it all a bit too confusing and scary, I suggest that they start by playing with a tool called the GLAM CSV Explorer. Um, it's, a, it's a web app and it pulls together hundreds of data sets shared by GLAM, Australian GLAM organizations through open government data portals. A lot of them are indexes to collections which have been transcribed by volunteers. So lots of name type data within them. Um, you can just select a data set from the drop down list and the tool will analyze the contents of the CSV file and will build a series of visualizations, um, which can be word clouds, they can be uh, uh, time charts. So it gives you a peek inside the data set um, and helps you think about the research possibilities. So again, you know, in terms of the why question, why bother downloading the CSV file? You start to get a peek inside before you have to actually commit to that sort of thing. The GLAM CSV Explorer runs as a web app, but it's actually a Jupyter Notebook underneath. Um, Jupyter Notebooks can be viewed and used in a number of different ways. Uh, for example, as slideshows, as dashboards, or as web apps. And this means I can create multiple versions of tools which are aimed at users with different levels of skill or experience. Um, Query Pick is another example. So it too now is available as a simple web app, no code to be seen. Um, just fill in a couple of boxes and click the button and you can create those visualizations of searches in Trove. But what does this simplicity hide? I mean, I think it, uh, researchers could, should always be encouraged to ask critical questions of the tools and the interfaces that we build. To help unpack some of the assumptions underlying Query Pick, I've created another notebook in the GLAM workbench that demonstrates how it uses search facet data from Trove, um, uh, from the Trove API. You know, as a researcher's skills and questions develop, they can analyze and modify the code. They can move beyond the interface. They can follow their questions. I've already described um, how using um, Query Pick and the Trove Newspaper Harvester, you can zoom out and then zoom back in again um, to view a complete set of search results. Um, the Harvester, like Query Pick, um, is available as a web app. So with just a couple of clicks, you can generate your own research data set with metadata. You can also include the OCR text. You can also include images of newspaper articles and even PDFs. 
Um, once you have your data set, um, you could, for example, take all that OCR text and load it into um, some sort of text analysis program. Um, Voyant tools, for example, is a popular one. So you can then start to examine the language of the newspaper articles in detail. Harvesting bulk data, creating custom data sets for in-depth analysis. I mean, these are common tasks that researchers um, might want to apply to a range of collections and data types. And there are uh, lots of different examples in the GLAM workbench. Um, <laughs> at least you got the picture. <laughs> Um, so some of the uh, the examples within the GLAM workbench are, are things like um, harvesting out OCR text from um, Trove's digitised books, journals, newspapers, harvest the front covers of Australian Women's Weekly and other uh, journals within Trove's or uh, any images from those, um, harvest uh, um, it, it, not just the sort of... Um, data that's been created by the digitization process. You can also access data about uh, user enrichments uh, and involvement. So for example, I've uh, got a notebook which shows you how you can harvest information, uh, harvest uh, uh, all the tags that users have applied to resources in Trove um, to get a sense of how people are, are themselves interacting with and organizing that information. Um, to get you started, and again to address the why as well as the how question, the GLAM workbench includes a series of pre-harvested data sets as well. Um, so all packaged up, ready to go. Um, and that includes things like um, 3,000 full-page editorial cartoons, which was harvested from the bulletin, um, one for every issue between 1886 and 1952. Um, and another example is... Um, a collection of 12,000 press releases and interviews from Australian federal politicians talking about refugees, which has been pulled in from the parliamentary library via Trove. Um, most recently, I was harvesting uh, details of digitised maps in Trove, um, and I realised that hidden away in the code of the web pages were actually the coordinates of the maps in some cases. Um, the metadata is not displayed in Trove, but it's sitting there underneath. So um, I uh, scraped that out of the web pages and added it to my data set of, of digitized maps. Uh, and that enabled me to do some fun things like um, on, the, on the left there, overlaying the historic maps on current base map, um, and also creating a map of maps. So you can uh, find where the maps are mapping from a map. Um, there's no core application that runs the GLAM workbench. Um, there's no digital platform that needs to be maintained. Uh, it's a collection of repositories, GitHub repositories containing Jupyter Notebooks. And each of those repositories contains config configuration files that enable the notebooks to be run on a variety of platforms. Um, different users will have different needs at different times. Um, throughout the GLAM workbench, you'll find links that say something like run live on binder or run live on ARDC binder as of recently. So binder is a technology that runs Jupyter Notebooks in the cloud. Um, just click those links and a customized computing environment will be created. And once it's ready, the notebook will load um, and you can start to do real work straight away. One click and you're away. Um, I should note in passing that the, the uh, original binder service based in Europe has had some capacity problems this year, um, which means sometimes the notebooks don't load or um, fail completely or take a long time. But just recently, the Australian Research Data Commons um, has launched its own binder service. Um, so I've started including links there, which will now load things in the ARDC binder. Um, at the moment, you do need credentials from an Australian university or research agency in order to access the ARDC binder service, but um, they're looking at ways of broadening that access. So um, keep an eye on that space. Um, so using binder helps the GLAM worker bench to overcome some of those initial barriers that might confront a novice user. You know, there's no installation of software required. Everything's configured for you. Um, and that convenience encourages experimentation. You know, just have a go. But it does have significant limits. Um, so uh, binder sessions don't save anything. So you need to download any data that you harvest or create, those sorts of things. 
um, every binder session starts with a new slate. So you've got to be aware of those sorts of limitations. Um, but I have created a number of options for researchers who might want to move on from that point. So if you are creating large harvests, large data sets, um, and the limits of binder becomes a problem, um, you can use a number of other cloud services. Uh, Reclaim Cloud is a commercial service, but it's created specifically for people working in the digital humanities. Again, the ARDC has a thing called the Nectar Cloud. Um, and um, and if you're you know happy uh, using Docker images, all of the Glam Workbench repositories are also available as Docker images. So you can that means you can run them on your own computer, or you can load them into another cloud service as well. So you know as your research needs change, as your skills develop, um, as your project grows, you have choices. You know you have ways to move forward with your project. Um, at least that's the plan. So the GLAM workbench is and will always remain a work in progress. Um, and for me, this whole enterprise is really a continuing exploration of the possibilities of GLAM data. Now, I'm hoping by this point that some of you will be thinking, well, you know, I've got some really good data, or I've got an API that would be really nice to get people, you know, doing a bit more with, doing a bit more ex experimentation. Maybe, maybe, you know, we could have something like the GLAM workbench. Uh, and indeed, yes, you can. Um, so I've documented the process of, of creating the repositories that underlie the GLAM workbench. Um, and I've even created a template repository, um, which means you can just go there, click on the green button, um, and create your own version of a repository, which includes everything you need to get started with your Jupyter Notebooks, uh, and also you know uh, everything you need to, configured to run them in binder, to create Docker images, all of that sort of stuff, which is built into the Glam Workbench, is automatically made available when you create one of these repositories. Um, obviously, you could do this if you want to create a new section of my Glam Workbench, and I would welcome that if you wanted to create a new section of the Glam Workbench. But equally, with a few changes, you could create your own Glam Workbench. Um, if you're interested in going down that route, um, this is an article that was just published recently, which talks about, uh, gives some guidance around best practice of, of creating um, Jupyter Notebooks to work with GLAM data. Um, and there are lots of other ways you can uh, get involved um, and contribute to the GLAM workbench if you're interested. Uh, the hardest part is always getting out information to people who might benefit from things like the GLAM workbench. So yes, feel free to share. Um, and you might also want to keep an eye on um, this. So uh, I'm currently working with the um, Australian Research Data Commons on a thing called the Community Data Lab. Um, my part of it is creating uh, a Trove data guide, which is really a, a very deep dive into uh, the sort of data that's available from Trove and how you get it out. Um, uh, it's still very much, uh, it's an ongoing thing, uh, work in progress, but as usual, I'm working in the open. So uh, people are welcome to dive in and have a look where I'm up to and add comments or suggestions. Um, and the Community Data Lab idea in general is something um, which is going to expand and develop beyond this first initial phase. Uh, the first phase is, is really focused on Trove, but um, next year it's planned that that will expand. Um, and that the um, Community Data Lab will be working with researchers to identify their needs and add new data sources. So it's taking some of the principles which actually underlie the GLAM workbench um, and using them to create uh, a new form of, of small-scale responsive research infrastructure. So it'll be really interesting to see how it develops. Um, most important to me, though, um, to finish up, is that the GLAM workbench itself is all open, right? It's free, of course. Um, it's all openly licensed, both the code and the documentation. Um, it's shared through GitHub. Each repository is also um, preserved in, in Zenodo, so it has citable DOIs. Um, so really, um, when it comes down to it, the point is take what's useful to you, share it, change it, do what you like. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Tim. That was great. Um, 
very interesting, just as interesting as I hoped it would be. Um, I wonder if there are any questions here in the room. Um, Shelley has a microphone. I have a microphone. I just right down here we do. Um, ah, I saw you first. <laughs> Uh, very quick, I wanted to say thank you very much. I was very uh, excited to hear the word voyant go by. So for those of you in the room who maybe didn't catch that or wondered, voyanttools.org, I encourage you strongly to have a look. It's a magical tool. Um, I've been looking forward a long time in our community to getting to the point where people think about searching for data in a different way, not the search box kind of way where they already have a preconceived notion about what they want to look for, but what might be in that data pile that they haven't thought to look for. And I see you shaking your head yes, so thank you for that. <laughs> I really appreciate that you understand where I'm coming from. So with Voyant Tools, I think it's a nice way to give people a window into what might be possible that they might not have thought of to ask for. And my question is, what are the possibilities? I hear you talking about the limitations in terms of the size of the data sets. So for the kind of data you see that we have, do you see the potential for voyant tools to help us dig around in those giant piles? Um, things like carrot squared, those kinds of things to visualize data. Um, uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, Voyant's a, a fabulous platform. You know, it's like, it's like hundreds of tools in one platform. Um, uh, and it's an example of, uh, you know, the broader field of natural language processing. Um, so being able to take some text and find patterns and structures within that text um, and then, uh, and, and yeah, and as you say, then those patterns and structures then, then can then become access points to that data. Um, and, um, you know, and it can be, I'm sure, you know, there's the people who are doing named entity extraction and things like that from, uh, you know, whether that's uh, uh, logbooks or diaries or those sorts of things, you know, there's all sorts of possibilities there. Um, but I think, yeah, I mean, and again, um, you know, this is where there are all sorts of interesting crossovers between fields, between sort of your field and and uh, the humanities, where we can, uh, you know, be looking at um, these sorts of structures, finding these structures, and then, uh, you know, finding the connections between the different entities that you might identify, which, you know, both is useful for, uh, you know, a study of language in itself, but also, as I say, then becomes these points of aggregation and access um, within collections. So, yeah, I mean, I, I would I would certainly suggest people play around with um, these sorts of tools like Voyant and other tools and, and get a sense of the possibilities. Um, as I say, it's about that. You know, a lot of it is about that, you know, just getting some sense of what might be possible um, and then, you know, being able to pursue that. Thanks. We've actually got a question online, so I'm going to jump in with that one um, and then throw to you, Shelley. Um, Michael Horton asks, this approach to API access sounds like a good thing, but has it ever exposed flaws in the API where a simple query has resulted in catastrophic time or resource use? <laughs> um, not that I'm aware of. <laughs> um, um, oh, look, uh, I mean, you know, those, I mean, I remember... Um, not this is not pre glam workbench, but when I was manager of Trove, um, we did have um, somebody in Europe who basically wanted to download all the books, uh, and that would be fine, except they were multi threading, um, so they were taking a lot of data in a very short period of time, and it did cause uh, impact on on other people accessing the data. Um, uh, in terms of Trove, they've upgraded the technology in recent years, so it's actually uh, performs much better than it used to. Um, yeah, I mean, um, I mean, it's something. Obviously, you know, that's part of learning about a data source uh, and is understanding its limitations. Um, so again, you know, it always always be encouraging people to to think about that and understand that. Um, uh, and you know there are you know a range of limitations, not just uh, the, the sort of underlying resource limitations. So, I mean, Trove itself has a um, a, a, a limit of now two hundred requests per minute, for example, um, for their API. It's also auth uh, an authentication. You need authentication. So, understanding the limits of any data source, of course, is an important part of starting to work with them. 
Um, thank you. Tim, Bob Mesabov. Um, as a Trove user, I noticed that failed OCR is pretty easily recognizable. It's gibberish in the OCR text. Have you ever done quantitative analyses to look at what failed OCR looks like and maybe how it could be recognized? Um, uh, personally, I did do a bit of exploration of this back oh, 10 years ago. Um, uh, uh, just yeah, uh, just doing sort of dictionary lookups on 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 um, words in OCR to see uh, what I could recognise, and the error rate was I think around twenty percent um, from that point of view. Uh, this is an area. I mean, as some of you might know, that um, the OCR output of Trove is actually correctable by users, so users can go in and actually uh, make changes to the OCR, um, and they have made uh, millions of corrections. But if you actually look at the overall stats, only about 6% of newspaper articles in Trove have any corrections at all. So there's a huge volume just because, you know, th just the scale is just such that there's a huge volume which hasn't had any corrections at all. Um, so what that means? Well, that what that means is that most of the corrections are not going to be done by humans. They're going to be done by machines. Um, so we're at the point now where there are already tools out there for, you know, starting to clean up OCR output um, and they're going to improve. Um, and there have already been some experiments within Trove of using automated means of, of cleaning up OCR output. Um, so I think eventually um, that, will, uh, that will be done by machines and the OCR will be cleaned up. Um, you can do some little experiments of your own if you want to. Um, so I've, I've done some little experiments with Query Pick, my visualization tool, for example. Um, if you just try searching for TBE, uh, which is a very common OCR error for the, um, and you can actually look at the occurrence of TBE as a sort of proxy for OCR quality. Um, and it's just something you can you know, try in a couple of minutes rather than having to harvest lots of data. Um, of course, it's another area. I mean, the thing about um, OCR quality too um, is it's one of, again, one of those things which has a huge impact on the research users, uses of Trove but it's not something which is um, sort of exposed to users. So, I mean, you can look at it, and yes, you're right, you can see when it's gibberish or not, but there's no sort of, you know, um, approximate percentages of accuracy or whatever, which might actually, actually be quite useful for somebody who's assembling a data set from those sources to get some sort of sense of what the accuracy is and how that might vary by period, by particular newspaper, for example, you know, having those sorts of stats, I think, would be really useful in terms of research uses of Trove. Thanks. I saw a couple more questions in the audience, at least two more, and we've got four minutes left. So um, we'll see if we can get through those. Thanks very much for your talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, have you got uh, like a sustainability plan? It seems that you've made an, an enormous personal contribution to, to building this tool. I mean, if you decided to go fishing for a year, have you got a team of apprentices that, can, that are <laughs> um, going to jump in and help? Yeah, it's an interesting question, is it? Because um, <laughs> uh, in the Australian context, um, I can uh, look at what I do and I can say that I have outlived several uh, research infrastructure projects, <laughs> humanities research infrastructure projects. You know, some of their stuff they create is just nowhere to be seen anymore. Um, so, you know, and often it's, you know, to be sustainable, you need institutional backing. Nope, <laughs> that doesn't always work. So it's a really interesting question. It's one that I've thought about quite a lot. Um, and my approach is basically that openness is my sustainability strategy. Um, so if I disappear, um, well, the, uh, the, the GitHub may or may not remain, the GitHub repositories, the Zenodo versions of the repositories should, should remain. So the code under, you know, all the repositories of the notebooks themselves should still be there and they'll all be openly licensed. So anybody can, you know, take those, fork those, develop their own version. Um, the documentation, of course, is also uh, open sourced and available in its own repository. So everything's there. Um, so that's sort of my approach to, um, you know, what might happen in the future is just keep it open. And again, to open to other contributions so that, um, uh, for example, uh, the Web Archives section, um, the UK Archives um, actually contributed uh, some code to that. Um, so they wanted to add their own collection data into the examples notebook. So they just, you know, forked the repository, made the changes. So 
keeping those sorts of possibilities open throughout the whole time so that those you know contributions can be made when you know the person or the institution has the time or the availability or whatever rather than sort of organize a, a project um, just to be open to that possibility I think you know means that those sorts of things can happen um, it's funny <laughs> funny funny in a funny way uh, <laughs> that um, I have been you know, giving talks like this for a number of years now um, and raising these uh, sorts of possibilities. Um, and now it seems like the Australian Research Data Commons um, has seen that this sort of approach of not building a new platform, but actually taking advantage of what's there and sort of small scale iteration and experimentation is actually a useful way to go. Um, and, um, and yes, that does then create other sustainability challenges, but it also means that the whole thing can be more responsive and that you can engage more people in the processes as you go along. Um, and um, that, um, yeah, that, that uh, just by being there, by being present, by creating those opportunities, you give things a life beyond what you do to them or what, by what you put into them. And so that's, that's sort of my approach. <laughs> Great, thanks very much. Um, we've run right up to four o'clock. Uh, I think there were other questions, but are you going to be around for a while? Um, yep, I'll hang around for a bit. Also, um, I, I like having my own Slack channel. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I've, so I did put the link to the slides in there, and I, you know, I just hang out on Slack quite a bit. Um, so if you want to follow up with me in that Slack channel, and that obviously goes to the folks tuning in from elsewhere um, I will you know be hanging out in there for a few days at least so feel free to, to to ask any questions there that's excellent thanks for making yourself available to us um, I've got a couple of housekeeping things uh, the first one is that this building will be open tomorrow and these rooms will be available for your use if you're not off bed watching or on a boat um, on your way to Bruni Island or anything like that. So if you'd like to book these rooms, you can go to the desk at the front as you come in and uh, book a time and a room for your use. There won't be any catering though, so you'll have to go out and get lunch and coffee. There's a lot around though um, and quite good food around here as well. Um, and the... Second thing was that if you've got any questions about the trips or events that you might have booked onto for Wednesday and you want to know more about it, the people at the entrance can help you with that as well. Um, I think that the the boat trip leaves very early in the morning, so that's a good thing to be on to um, before you go to bed tonight. I think that's about it for housekeeping. Um, thank you so much, Tim. That was fantastic. Ah, and it's afternoon tea time. <laughs>